Penn State football fans, passionate ones, know the Nittany Lions inside and out. They know their team like the back of their hand. But what about from a national perspective? How do the people that are looking at the big picture view where the Nittany Lions sit in that? That's what we're getting today. J.D. Pakel from our On3 YouTube channel, our national desk. He's going to be here to join me to talk about the Nittany Lions, some of the big picture items for them, and to take a look at the broader picture for college football. That's coming up on the BWI Daily Edition. Always fun to meet new people, to have new conversations about football. One of my favorite things to do, host Thomas Frank Carr of the BWI Daily Edition. My friends call me T. Frank, and I'm hoping that J.D. is uh, going to be a friend of mine in the future. We're talking with J.D. Pakel of the Hard Count with uh, J.D. Pakel for the On3 YouTube channel. J.D., welcome to the BWI Daily. T. Frank, appreciate you having me on, man. I'm, I'm fine to be here and excited to talk about the Lions, man. We were uh, talking just before this thing got teed up. Very, very close to football time. So excited to talk about it with you, brother. Yeah, I can't help myself. It's like a tick. Every time somebody asks a question, I'm like, then there's a five minute explanation about a football thing. Great conversation. I feel like we're going to have a great time here. Uh, but uh, let's get started with the Nittany Lions. Let's talk about uh, what your view is of where Penn State fits in. Just broad sense of what do you think of this program right now after the ascendance under James Franklin previously, Big Ten Championship, Lots of 10 win seasons last two seasons, though, through the pandemic and last year, obviously not up to that standard. So what is your view of Penn State football from the outside looking in? Yeah, I think the outside looking in perspective is Penn State's a team that's really solid. I know in-house the feeling is, man, if we could just take that next step, you know, they've been a solid team. We're seven and six last season. A lot of people have them penciled in as like an eight win team this coming year, which a lot of programs, T. Frank, they would kill for eight wins. They would give their left arm and a kicker for eight wins, but Penn State obviously <laughs> looking to take the next step. So for me, it all comes down to what is Sean Clifford going to bring to the table here? He's play played college football for like 24 years, been around forever and a half. So I'm excited to see him hopefully get over the hump, you know, get himself back together after maybe a, a tough year with the injury and then having the COVID year before that. So for him to settle in, have a clean slate, I'm excited to see what he brings to the table. Uh, obviously got to replace a guy like Jahan Dotson, and they got to help him out in the run game too. I mean, that is headlined, circled, underlined, sharpied, starred, all that. I mean, you got to have somebody you can hand the ball to if you're back there playing quarterback. And I know there is a ton of buzz about Nick Singleton. Maybe not being the guy game one, but as the season draws on, potentially being your bell cow. So a lot of reason for optimism. Uh, it is August, so I guess everybody in the country is optimistic. But mm -hmm. in terms of what the national picture is for Penn State, it's solid. Let's see what they do to take that next step to get to where they ultimately, I think, could be if some things break their way. Yeah, it, it's always the sky is falling for some people and eternal sunshine for other people. And I'm always in the camp of eternal sunshine during August because it's a sunny month. It's a beautiful day outside. <sighs> Uh, but let's get to Sean Clifford. You mentioned him right off the bat, and all those caveats are great, and you you bring up all the great points of helping him out in the run game, but he is a six-year quarterback. He would be collecting his pension in the NFL at this point if he was in the NFL. So uh, what are your expectations for him on an individual basis? Do you think he can get back to playing the football in 2019 where maybe he was a passenger on that team, but he was actively participating in uh, creating plays for the offense and Penn State was a double digit win team. Can he get back to that point or what is your, what is your expectation for his skill level this fall? Yeah, I think to answer that question, I think he can. Um, and I hate to sort of take the cop out answer, but it really does come down to how much are you going to help him in the run game, because when the defense is able to just sit back and put eight people back there and rush three, it makes your job a lot harder as a quarterback. So if they can keep defenses honest, they can just have somebody to turn the ball, uh, excuse me, turn to hand the ball to, that's going to be a really big deal for him to get back to that level of, of playing. Because I don't think it's, I don't think it's a matter of talent for Sean Clifford. I really don't. I think it's been, like I said, a weird last year and a half with the COVID season and the injury. So I think he's probably a little bit more hungry than he has been in the past coming back from that injury. Um, probably feels like he has something to prove, probably has that chip on his shoulder. So I think ultimately if they can just complement his game a little bit, 
They're going to ask him to do more in the pass game, obviously, with some of those weapons having left with Jahan Dotson, like we just said, has, has gone to the NFL to do big-time things, I'm sure. But if they can help him in the run game, I think he's poised to, to get back to that caliber of play that we saw in the past. So Penn State fans are, uh, right now, for a lot of them, the jury is still out on offensive coordinator Mike Yersich in his second year with the Nittany Lions. I want to take a step back if we could. And if you do, you know, I want to, if you, if you uh, have viewed his work previously at Oklahoma state at Texas in 2020, or of course, when he was the passing game coordinator at Ohio state, uh, what is your view of him as a play caller, his system and all of those things that go into the ecosystem that these players are in. Do you think that this is something that can help and accentuate John, Sean Clifford's skills and diminish his weaknesses? Or is this a situation where, um, you know, I, I just in general, what are your thoughts about Mike Yersich as the OC for the Nittany Lions? Yeah, I think ultimately it's going to compliment Sean Clifford because a lot of what Mike Yersich does is so quarterback centric. But at the same time, he's trying to help him with motions and the read option game and whatever they're going to do to try and give him a more simplistic picture. So I think, Ultimately, what this should do for Sean Clifford is just slow the game down, allow him to have a simple picture in front of him and be able to, to kind of play a little bit more instinctually. And so for a guy like Sean Clifford, who has played, like you said, he's be, he'd be collecting his pension if you were playing in the NFL. For a guy like Sean Clifford to have a, a, a you know, the, the speed of the game isn't the problem, isn't the problem for him. It's a lot of, you know, having things that are going to help him on this offense. And so I think that Mike Yersich's offense will ultimately do that. I mean, we've seen what he's done in the past at a number of these programs, like you mentioned. So um, to answer your question, it's going to very much so depend on what Sean Clifford does in, in an in-game setting. But in terms of the X's and O's, it should give him an edge or two uh, when it comes to that pre-snap and during the week film study. Can we dive a little bit deeper into what you talked about earlier with helping him with the run game? And one of the things I've been writing and talking about here on the show is that we haven't seen Mike Yurch's, Yurch's system because last season it turned into survival mode. Like you need to call plays to get yards and points. So when it comes to a system and, and a run game that works with your passing game, how beneficial can that be for the quarterback? And how beneficial can that be for the team overall when things are actually cohesive? Yeah, I think the word that comes to mind is balance, right? Because like we talked about, if you're going to just sit back there and say, okay, we know you can't run the ball, so we're not even going to worry about it. Well, at that point, you're playing left-handed the whole game anyway. And so a lot of it does depend on these, this offensive line, which is a little bit inexperienced. So they went to the portal, got my guy Hunter Norzad from Cornell, which is, in my opinion, a steal of the transfer portal. Uh, Nick Singleton, I think they will ask him to play sooner rather than later. A lot of excitement around him, but – it really will come down to, okay, what else can you add to make this offense go? Because if, if there's no gas in the car, it doesn't matter what Mike Yurcich is calling or, or if they have the perfect play drawn up, if they don't have the guys out there to get that defense on their heels or to get the look they want to begin with. So it's, it's sort of a cop-out, sort of a cliche answer, but it really is about what do you have in stock on this offense to allow the system to then play itself out? Because if they can't run the football, it's going to be hard to set up the pass. Yeah, a couple other positions uh, for the Nittany Lions getting uh, Mitchell Tinsley in the transfer portal. I know on through is very high about that acquisition. Uh, when it comes to the weapons around Sean Clifford, the tight ends, um, how do you think that this offense in general, if you're going to make a prediction with what you've seen kind of from that high level, do you think that this offense can get there? Do you think they can get to a point where they can take that next step? Yeah, I think they definitely can. It really does to me hinge on the run game. And I feel... I feel mm -hmm. bad just saying that over and over again, but you're not the only one. You're not the yeah. only one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, especially in, in Big Ten country, right, where you're lining up in 12 personnel, sometimes even 13 personnel bringing in the big boys over there at Wisconsin. Yeah, it, it really matters. It's it really is a game of, OK, you got to be able to play in the trenches in this league. And mm -hmm. if they if they can't I mean to win seven games last year without a hundred yard rusher in itself tells you what they have. And a lot of that probably is a testament to Jahan Dotson as well. But. I mean, they, they've got guys on this roster that can play. I mean, I now imagine if they have the defense having to be honest against the run game. Imagine if they have to honor a running back coming downhill at you, let's say, 30, 40 times a game. That changes the entire complexion of the way that you call a game for Mike Yersich. So I think the offense can get there. It really does all start and end up front for me because that's going to change the entire picture for the receivers. It's going to change Sean Clifford's game and ultimately just give them a good jumping off point to get mm -hmm. this thing started.
What do you think about Manny Diaz coming over from Miami? Uh, now the defensive quarter for the Nittany Lions. What do you think about what he does on that side of the ball? Yeah, you and I talked a little bit before the show even got started about, hey, he's going to be running that 4-2-5 that kind of defense, and you're not sure what you're getting there if you're a Nittany Lions fan. Obviously, different coordinators and different programs and different conferences, so I don't want to you know, riff too much on this, but look at what Ron Roberts did at Baylor. Look at what Jim Knowles did at Oklahoma State a year ago, and now he's going to Ohio State, obviously, so he'll be in conference, but Worked out pretty well for both those defenses. I mean, they were top 15 in the country in terms of yards allowed per a game on the ground. So they're going to be able to play in the trenches. What I love so much about the defense Manny Diaz is bringing to the table is the fact that it allows you to match up when you do play those Ohio States. When you do play those teams, they're going to spread you out and put those freak shows out on the outside. You have an answer to that in theory with the personnel you have on the field. Now, Manny Diaz specifically – I'm always intrigued when you have a guy who was a head coach at a big time program, a very visible program in Miami, and now taking a a step back, if you will, and, you know, title at least to being a defensive coordinator. Is that going to be something to where he's like, okay, cool. I have less on my plate now having to manage an entire program. I can just get back to football, get back to what I love about this. Or is it a feeling of, man, I want that next job. I want to get back to being a head coach. I want to get back to where I was and kind of allow you to, overlook some things that otherwise you know would go into a successful game plan so I think that's something to watch for as well it's not something that I necessarily would foresee from Andy Diaz but like I said anytime a head coach goes from head coach back to coordinator I'm really intrigued as to how they take that and how they're able to, to sort of bounce back from I mean, let's call it what it is anytime you're the head coach going to a coordinator you know it's it's a demotion of sorts but yeah. excited for him believe in that system and think it'll allow them to, to match up well are there any players uh, from a national perspective that stand out to you from the Nittany Lions that you think can take a step to more prominence as far as not just they're very good players, but get that recognition for being one of the best in the Big Ten or, you know, potential All-Americans, anything like that? Any players individually that stand out to you that you've got your eye on? I mean, someone who jumps off the tape when you watch him, and you know this probably better than anybody, Joey Porter Jr., is yeah. a freak show. I mean, he is <laughs> he is so fun to watch. I think he's probably gone back and forth between safety and corner. When I watched him, he was, he was playing a little bit of safety for the Nittany Lions. Maybe that was situational. But, I mean, talk mm-hmm. about size, speed, ball skills. Obviously, his daddy being one of the, one of the best to ever play in that Pittsburgh Steelers organization. Uh, I'm excited to see him take that next step in terms of national recognition because I think a yeah. lot of people in the Big Ten know Joey Porter Jr., But, I mean, folks, if you take the time to just turn on a game and watch this dude run sideline to sideline or cover one of their big-time receivers, he is so fun to watch as a defensive player, which is saying something. So uh, I'm excited for a lot of people nationally to find out more about him because he is is a playmaker. I mean, he's a football player through and through. The, The first time I saw him on the field for the Nittany Lions, I joked he looks like a condor. His arms are so long that he just engulfs people and i I gotta ask you uh you know as as a former football player the armband right so you got the banded look that's what joey does is that supposed to make you look bigger because it just looks like his arms go on forever you know i think i don't know if it helps so much with length that might be what i mean hey joey porter jr is playing at a higher level than i ever did so maybe he's got some kind of inside you know inside trader secrets from his from his daddy but uh, I, I always believed, hey, you put the armband at the top of the bicep and the bottom of the bicep, get a oh, little yeah. bit more of a pump on game day. Yeah. That's That was always my play. Hey, I'm, I'm like 5'11". I'm not the tallest guy in the world, but if I can have a little bit of extra juice when I walk out there, at least make them think I do, uh, that's usually the play for me. So uh, high high uh, football IQ with the, with the armbands there by Joey Porter Jr. Yeah, you got to get it right there so that when you put the point of the ball in, it even makes it look even bigger. So you got you got the whole thing segmented out. Uh, there you go. Let's talk, crucial. Let's let's talk about uh, the Big Ten as a whole. Where do you see Penn State fitting into the pecking order? Obviously in the East, which is a loaded uh, division, but then as as the the conference in general, one of the best conferences in in college football. Where do you see things breaking down this year, and who are the teams that you're looking for to finish it, you know, at the end of the season competing for that championship to get to that championship game? You know, I think Penn State's in that upper tier, and a lot of it does depend on can they run the ball and Sean Clifford and all those things that we already talked about. But I think 
just based on talent alone, like if you just roll the ball out there tomorrow, nobody practices, and you just go play some games, I think Penn State, just from talent alone, has a lot in the cupboard to be excited about. Uh, in terms of the rest of the conference, it's hard to talk about the Big Ten and not talk about Ohio State. A team that I think is poised to potentially take a step back, which is maybe not saying a ton given they were in the playoff a year ago, but Michigan, if they're not playing J.J. McCarthy, I don't know how far they can go in terms of how much they can open it up offensively. But also at the same time, I said it on our show, I don't know how you turn your back on a guy like Cade McNamara. So I think Michigan will have their own deal. They got to sort out there at the quarterback spot, but with how much they lost on defense, there's some, you know, there's some cause for concern there, obviously. But uh, so to answer your question, I think Penn state is probably in that three or four spot in the big 10, depending on how you feel about some of these other programs with, like, like I said, how you feel about Michigan, how you feel yeah. about Wisconsin and, and what they're going to do this coming year. But uh, I really think Ohio State's going to be on a mission this year. And I know that's probably, you know, contrary to popular, probably not opinion, but popular uh, want to believe. Um, I mean, they're, they're just stacked this year. They're going to be better on defense. C.J. Stroud should be in New York City for the Heisman Trophy ceremony. So yeah. the Buckeyes should be exciting, but I think Penn State's very much so on, on the uh, the front door, if you will, of getting into that top two or three range. You, you stole the question right out of my mouth about C.J. Stroud. Uh, I want to go back to Michigan, though, and then I, we're coming back to the Ohio State offense. The thing about Michigan, and, and again, I think Penn State fans view what happened last year and how they steamrolled Ohio State in that game at the end of the season and really put a, you know, a stamp on their year. I guess I've always contended that you mentioned they've got a, a mini quarterback controversy there. They've got a couple of good options that played well last year, but it's so hard. You have to play such good football and have such good players everywhere. You mentioned the defense losing some players, the offense. Can you replicate that plan of attack when Michigan has tried to do this in the past and it didn't work the same way to the same level, losing Josh Gaddis? It just seems like when you, when you talk about maybe they take a step back, there's a lot of attrition there. Do you think that you know they can replicate what they did a year ago and play that smash mouth football and, and really – continue and build upon what they did in 2021. Yeah, T. Frank, I think you hit it on the head, man. For Michigan to replicate the kind of success they had in the win and loss column a year ago, they got to change the recipe because they don't have the ingredients they had. I mean, you can't make yeah. cookies if you don't have chocolate chips, if you don't have the eggs. And Hassan Haskins was the eggs for them last year a lot of the time. I mean, I mean, embodied what I think Jim Harbaugh wants in terms of an offense at Michigan, kind of the downhill. We're going to pound it at you. We're going to play with a fullback. We're going to play with tight end. Uh, they got a lot of talent. I mean, it's, it's not for a shortage of talent in that backfield, but they're different backs than Hassan Haskin was. I mean, Donovan Edwards uh, should be a matchup nightmare. Um, Blake Corum is back. Their offensive line is going to be solid. A lot of great tight ends. But like you said, for them to get back to the college football playoff, for them to win the Big Ten, they got to have something else throwing the ball downfield because the defense isn't going to be as elite as they were. Obviously, you lose those two bookends on the on the edge with uh, Hutchinson and Ojabo. I mean, they were just game changers last year for them and really were great equalizers. I mean, you could roll the ball out there, and if Michigan scored 21 points, well, you felt pretty good about your chance to win, depending on who you had you know, on the other side of the field. So ultimately, they got to find a way to score more points. And I think that's just what it comes down to at the end of the day. Um, with J.J. McCarthy, that's what I think a lot of people are calling for with, hey, if, if J.J. McCarthy's playing, we can open it up. We can get the ball spread around to some of these playmakers. But if it's Cade McNamara, they feel like, OK, and then we got to go and, and kind of repeat the equation we had a year ago. So yeah. uh, credit to Josh Gaddis and credit to everything he did there winning the way they did. But I would 100 percent agree with the sentiment. If we're going to get back to where we were, we got to mix up the formula to have the same results. And speaking of points, I, I know I say this knowing full well that Chris Olave and uh, his counterpart there, uh, whose name is escaping me here in a second, both won his first round picks. Um, sure, Garrett Wilson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Garrett, thank you, Garrett Wilson. I'm here um, for you. Yeah. Is, is Ohio State's receiving core, is there potential that they're better this year? with Jackson Smith and Jigba and that and that Rose Bowl game that I think just kind of opened everybody's eyes where Utah was scoring on every phase. They had everything going. And just at the end of the day, Ohio State was three deep of potential All-Americans after losing two. So is that just that game or do they have that ability to take it to another level 
this uh, this fall? I think you'll see the receiving core. I mean, the, the talent will be stable. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson being first rounders, never a good thing to lose those kind of guys. I think what you'll see more so is CJ Stroud taking that next step. And that's right. just going to elevate the receiving core. I mean, Julian Fleming, uh, G. Scott moving to tight end. He's he's going to be a baller. Um, I mean, and Jigba, I mean, we, Marvin Harrison Jr. I mean, we, we could just keep going down the list here of guys they have that have tons of ability. Uh, but I think they're all going to benefit a lot from C.J. Stroud taking that next step in this offense, taking that next step as a leader. Because it's, it's you know, sort of lost in the shuffle of how great his stats were. But there were times, especially early in the year last year with C.J. Stroud, where you watched him and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. It's his first year as a starting yeah. quarterback in college right. football. I hadn't completed a pass. And so we saw that in games against Tulsa, saw that against Oregon. Even though he put up really good numbers throughout the duration of the season, I think he still has more uh, to put on for the national stage. So I'm excited for him. Um, so the receiving core, I think you could see equal, if not better, production. But I think that'll be a byproduct of, of C.J. Stroud's maturation and, and taking that next step as a quarterback. Such a cagey answer. J.D. Pakel of On3, uh, our main YouTube channel here, our national channel, The Hard Count with J.D. Pakel. Uh, what are the other teams that Penn State fans should know about on a national stage? Who are the teams you're looking for that you think have a real shot this year to be in that national championship game or in the college football playoff? And are there any names that don't start with Alabama uh, or, or you know the regular people, Georgia, that we're used to? Yeah, so I think you got to pencil in, like you said, Bama and probably Ohio State, like we were just talking about a second ago. Uh, I'm actually a little bit cooler on Georgia than than most people are. I think Stetson Bennett has kind of proven who he is, which is, I mean, credit to him. He's got some jewelry on his finger now, but similar to Michigan, I think they got to change how they do things. They're not going to have, you know, likely a generational defense like they did a season ago. Um, I'm really interested to see what happens in the ACC and in the Big 12, because both those conferences kind of feel like there's a little bit of a, of a shift, at least in terms of maybe the throne being a little bit more vacant than it was in previous years. Because before you remember, it was Clemson. It felt like every year it was Oklahoma every year. Um, feels like those thrones are maybe not as secure as they were, obviously, with neither of those teams winning the deal. So uh, it'll be a dogfight in both those conferences. Oddly enough, I think Clemson does kind of return to form if they can have just marginal, you know, marginal production improvement at the quarterback spot, whether it's DJ Uyunglele or whether it's Kate Klubnik. Uh, and then mm-hmm. in terms of the Big 12, I think Dylan Gabriel and Jeff Levy is a dangerous combination. I think Brent Venables won't have as much of a um, up to speed period as a lot of people want to assume just because, you know, he's been at Oklahoma. He knows Oklahoma. He knows what he wants to implement as a head coach, even though it's his first time doing it. So I'm excited about both those programs. They're both my college football playoff picks in terms of those other two spots. But outside of that, I mean, there's there's no shortage of storylines, which is beautiful and and why you and I both love the sport so much. But um, in terms of the Pac-12, it's I mean, it it feels like it could be USC, feels like it could be Utah. I was on a different podcast the other day talking about this. Um, Even though USC has seemingly overhauled everybody and anybody that they want in the transfer portal, I still think the toughness of Utah is going to be what, yep. what wins out. So um, excited to watch it all play out. I cannot wait for football to get here, man. It is just dragging its feet after it sped its way all the way to, what, 19 <laughs> days now at the time of this recording. But uh, those are all uh, my tidbits, if you will, in terms of other national teams to keep an eye on. I got tingles. I got tingles through the whole conversation <laughs> talking about football. It's here. Uh, and last thing here is get to know JD a little bit more. Uh, you're actually not a stranger to the Northeast. You played at Cornell, correct? Yes, sir. The Big Red. So you're He's saying good. when you're talking about Hunter Norzad, you got some inside intel about Penn State getting a steal in the transfer portal. Man, I, I am a big Hunter Norzad fan. I, I'm buying stock in Hunter Norzad. He was actually a freshman when I was a senior at Cornell uh, out of the state of Georgia. And he was a guy who played with us or played for us, I should say, as a freshman, which in the Ivy League is a little bit less common because you don't get that developmental redshirt year. A lot of kids are coming from programs. And, and quite frankly, there's a little bit of a trade off between ability and act score you got to kind of find that sweet spot to get them in the school and so uh i mean hunter norzad is is a power five player through and through 
uh, had his pick of the litter as, as a lot of people watching this show well know. So um, excited for him, but yeah, man, it, it, it was a lot of fun to be able to go up in the Northeast for four years. Uh, I'm actually from Southern California before that. So I, you know, hit the Dick's Sporting Goods or wherever was available in Southern California that sells uh, winter coats, got some boots, but <laughs> no, it was, uh, it, it was a great chapter, but happy to be back in some, some warmer temperatures here in Nashville. But yeah, the Northeast is uh, a special place. I try to do my homework. Uh, and I just, I couldn't help myself. I found this, uh, when I was scrolling around doing a little bit of Golly. homework on you, look at this guy, great open speed from JD doing a little bit of a, a little bit of that slashback work playing everywhere Golly. in the backfield. Yeah, man. Hey, I, you know, if, if, if they needed something, I was, I was in to do it, but, uh, golly, this is hysterical. I was, I was not ready for this. Yeah, man. So they, they split me out and play, play some slot. I'd play in the, in the backfield. Uh, it's big 87 over there. Tommy McIntyre, he grad transferred to SMU. I mean, we, we had some guys. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, man. I, I definitely, uh, reminisce my fair share about the days where you get to suit up in the fall, oh, but, that. uh, Man, I hey, whatever we needed, I was I was in for it, man. Here we go against against Harvard, against the Crimson. That was so fun, man. I think that's one of the most pure forms of of college football is the Ivy League because they don't play in the playoff, the FCS right. playoff. I mean, you know, they, they don't play. Um, the, the transfer portal isn't really a thing unless you're a fifth year. Um, I mean, it, it's special, man. The, you know, you suit up on a fall Saturday in the Yale Bowl, or you go to Providence, Rhode Island, and, and play the Brown Bears. It's it's a it's a special form of football, man. And uh, I'm excited to see a lot of these guys with the COVID season get an extra year and go go show their stuff at the Power Five level, like uh, like Hunter Norza. Man, this is taking me back here, T. Frank. You are this so is, this, hard this is to awesome. tackle. You are so hard to tackle. Don't let JD get in the open field because bam, look at that. Breaking tackles, getting downfield. JD, this is so much fun. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. T Frank, appreciate you having me, man. Football is almost here. Excited to get you on, uh, on our show here in the near future. We talk Penn State, but no, this is a blast, man. Yeah, and make sure you go follow the On3 YouTube channel, our national channel already. Uh, over 10,000 viewers. We're getting that number higher and higher. So if you're a Penn State fan, uh, we, we're, we are lending our power to the, the national channel. So go follow them over on YouTube. Uh, and of course, if you want to, make sure you subscribe here to the BWI Daily Edition on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. We're cooking as we're getting into football season, doing all kinds of video. We'll give you breakdowns and, of course, insight into practice. Penn State opens up practice on Wednesday. So make sure you're looking for our highlight videos, breakdowns of what we see there. JD, thanks again. We'll be back tomorrow on the BWI Daily Edition. Until then, uh, we'll talk to you later.